and welcome to Fat Squirrel Speaks. Today is Monday, September 30th. I am Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. Thanks for coming over on this last day of September, and it feels like it. Um, we have a very September-y, late September day today. It's... the light has changed, like in the last week maybe two but really the last week the light has definitely changed in terms of like you can just tell right like the angle of the light is different it's darker in the morning when I'm getting up um, it's definitely darker in the evenings as I'm going to bed and it's just it's still really warm like we're still um, in the upper 70s and then maybe even in the 80s some days uh, so it's still really warm it doesn't have that like crispy quality to the air yet but it's uh, a little bit drearier it's a little it's just different and I can tell because my contentment and maybe energy is not the right word but like energy not like energy but like energy has oomphed up and my husband's has like oomphed down <laughs> We are diametrically opposed season-wise. Um, so he's starting to get like morose and like Mwah. Whereas I'm like, oh, I did my fall. I did some fall cleaning. Now that is not to say that, you know, my house is clean because it's definitely not. Um, but I did some, I don't do spring cleaning. I'm a tend to be a fall cleaning person. So like that grimy stuff that's like in the kitchen that's like open storage stuff that you just like look at everyone's around like, oh gosh, why are we the dirtiest people ever? Like that stuff is the stuff I clean. <laughs> but anyway, but thanks for coming over. Uh, get a snack, get a tea. I, as part of the fall cleaning, I did clean out all of the tea and coffee selections and like reorganize them and make them all tidy and nice so you can go choose from many a hot beverage option um i did eat the last apple last night sorry <gasps> have you tried this crips crips pink right it's c-r-i-p-p -P, apostrophe s pink um the only place i've seen the only place i've seen them is at our whole foods um they're sort of, they're very much like a pink lady in terms of like their flavor profile. They might be just like a smidge more mellow, but they're a little bit less like painful. <laughs> like, I don't know. I really like pink ladies. And when they first, when we first started seeing them, I was so excited about them uh, because I do love a firm apple, but Pink ladies can also be like, they can also, their skins can almost like cut your gums if your gums are a little sore that day or something, or like you're just not feeling robust. Uh, they can, they can beat you down, the pink ladies. And so these Crips Pink, now I've only gotten them a couple of times, so that could just be the few I've gotten. But these few I've gotten have been really nice. They're just, they're very, they've got that nice sweet tart balance. Um, they don't have a ton of like subtlety in the flavor, like a gold rush or something like that, but they do have a nice bright flavor and a good texture. Again, crisp, but not hard. Like again, I love pink ladies, but they can almost be sharp. Um, so they're just like a smidge more delicate on the, on the texture side. But they're very enjoyable. That's the only place I've seen them so far, but Hopefully we'll be seeing more of them. I don't know. Um, pink ladies suffer, like they can suffer from internal browning. And there is a thing that's called a thing. Um, so like I stopped buying pink ladies for a while because you would buy them and they would look beautiful, but then you would cut into them and they would be like brown inside. Not rotten, but browned, like more than just oxidized. Like it was weird. Um, and it's something to do with the, how they store them. Um, and so I don't, I've not had that happen in a long time. I don't know if it's just because like they are more susceptible to it and they didn't have that worked out yet. Um, I haven't had that trouble in a long time, but uh, we'll see how these little Crips Pink do in that front. 
I'm excited about them so far though. But sorry, I did eat them all. But you're an excuse I should go get more and then we can have some. That's a good excuse to get more, right? Oh, thank you for being patient with change of venue. Uh, just had to do a little reshuffling with people coming home. I say that like there's many people in my house. There's one other human in my house, but they came home. <laughs> so, um, yes, we have no shenanigans. We have no shenanigans today. I was really hoping to um, talk to you about a spinning class that I was going to take Saturday with my friend Malia in Bloomington at Rebel Pearl. Uh, that's their yarn store there. Uh, but unfortunately, I was testing positive for COVID and could not go. Yes, friends. My hermit lifestyle lasted me so long. I was a novid for a very, very long time, but I finally succumbed. Uh, my husband had gone to the VA and I think picked it up there. Uh, luckily, we had uh, very fairly mild cases. I mean, we felt pretty much like hot garbage for like three or four days, but um, mostly just felt like garbage. Uh, didn't have any sort of terribleness. So I'm thankful for that. Thankful for a vaccinated body that uh, carried me through. And so I might be a little breathier. I might be a little bit more congested, but that's just because we have, I have the remnants still of uh, some congestion and stuff. So that's what's going on with that. But uh, what a bummer. Now, next weekend, so I think it's October 4th and 5th, Bloomington is having a fiber festival. Is that like surprise first time? Um, so if you're in Indiana or in the area and you're interested, uh, it's in Bloomington, Indiana, which is about an hour south of Indianapolis. And I have no idea what it'll be like. It's at the fairgrounds. So we'll try it out and see what it's like. And then there's a Southern Indiana Fiber Fair in just like a few more weeks. I think it's the weekend of Rhinebeck, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that one I will not be going to, but this one I might, I'm going to try, I think, because why not? We'll see what goes on. But so, yeah, so those are all the, that's the, the, the lack of shenaniganing. Um, let's get into the crafting because while I did have a few days where I literally was just like watching Poirot and by watching, I mean, it was on in the background as I was in and out of consciousness. <laughs> Like, I do know, like, I, I do know I'm sick if I can't even do some sort of handcraft. Like, it's one thing if you're tired of the evening. Sometimes I have evenings where I'm just like, blah. Um, but I had like a few days where I was just like not crafting because my body was like, nope, you will be resting and you will do that whether you want to or not because we were taking those, that autonomy out of your hands. But it was nice to have the comfort of the Poirot on in the background. Um, and I did get some crafting done. And so let's get into that stuff. First off, um, there are still bags in the shop if you're interested. There's some deliciously cute fall bags. There's even a few Halloween bags still. Um, so if you're interested, those are in the shop, fatsquirrelfibers.com. I told you last time I was having a little bit of like a quilting itch and I still have it. Um, but I did put together a project which I then decided I hated and now I'm back to like, well, maybe. I bought, uh, I have a very dear friend who loves Frida Kahlo. And I wanna say a couple years ago, there was a fabric, there's been several fabric lines that have come out over time. But I happened to be at Crimson Tate and she had half yard packs of this one. And so I went ahead and bought this fabric, which, this is this one really good. Um, I brought this fabric and it just sort of sat uh, because a couple things different happened and like I wasn't sure if I should do this quilt for this friend or not because I wasn't sure, whatever, things, drama, um, not between the two of us, but in, in the like roundabouts of her life. So I had just sort of sat on it because I wasn't sure. And then it came to a point where I was like, oh, I could actually make that quilt for her now. And I think it would be at a place where she'd be able to receive it well. And then I put it together and I hated it. So it's one of these like busier fabrics. Like this is sort of like, I feel like in knitting world, when you first start knitting, not 
exclusively, but when you first start knitting, you're so excited about variegated yarns, right? They're so gorgeous. They're so exciting. And then you kind of like establish this like, um, stash of them. And then you kind of come like, again, everybody's tastes wax and wane and things you're interested in just change over time. And like, they might circle back, but usually like for me, I should say usually for me, I had this point of like, Oh, these are so fun and amazing and magical. And then like, I've been in a more of a like, what I actually want to use are solids and tonals. And so these beautiful, very artistic skeins just sort of sit and stash as like beautiful objets d'art. Um, but I'm not using them as much. And I feel like this happens with fabric too. Like these bigger scale, like fun in the yardage fabrics are really exciting and they're they draw you in and you're like oh i love this pattern but then when you actually go to make them it's more of a challenge to figure out how to use them um now there's there's a couple of different ways you can think about it you can think about it like oh like um like the properties of color and shade and all that stuff are still the same whether the piece is like this big or this big whether you're reading um like a whole pattern or whether you're just getting like a little tiny piece because you've cut the pieces very small but when you're trying to like maintain like for example this has a lot of free collar stuff in it and i was trying to maintain that uh, because that's the reason i bought it then it sort of limits what you can do with the fabric right like because the smaller you cut it up the less likely you're actually to maintain uh, those images that you want so i kind of went back and forth and back and forth and so i decided I needed something that would have big enough pieces that you would still like the fabrics integrity would be re remain. But then in reality, those are just like not the quilt I like. Um, so I did this disappearing nine patch. Okay. And it's where you sew nine in this case, five and a half inch squares together, like three by three by three, like three by three. Um, and then you cut them down the middle on the horizontal and the vertical and then you kind of rotate them and they re they reassemble into this block and there's a couple of different ways you can reassemble them like again you can imagine the permutations of how you could rotate blocks and things like that so i decided on this because it would be pieces that were big enough it wouldn't be terribly fussy um etc etc and like I wouldn't need to get extra blenders. That's also another factor of like, I had seven half yards. And so like that's enough to do something with. And so I didn't want to like get a bunch of blenders in with it and then like have a bunch of this fabric left over. There's just, it's drama. It's crafting drama. We all know it, right? We don't all know it. Some of us are overthinkers. Okay, let's not, let's rebrand this. Some of us are thinker thinkers. I don't want to say it's overthinking because it is. And I don't want to like label it as bad. It is just how my brain does stuff. Um, is it inconvenient? Sometimes yes. That's okay. <laughs> so anyway, I put this quilt together. Well, I did all my blocks and there's a couple of different permutations. I like this guy. I have four different permutations. Um, of blocks and that came together and then one of them I put together wrong so like one of them the pattern is not completely right side up on all things what are you gonna do right um but so I put it I have uh, in my upstairs hallway so like when you go up my stairs there's sort of like a landing um and I have one wall there that's that's big enough to put like a piece of flannel and try to put some blocks up. And so I put the blocks up there and I hate it. <laughs> I, I really don't like it. And I should know better, right? Like, cause I know, so here's sort of, I'll put a picture in here. Yeah, I hate it. And so I'm in this place of trying to decide like, is it okay that I hate it? And like, I don't want to waste this fabric. So I should just stitch it together. But we're also on this point of like, I've invested, yes, I don't want to waste this fabric or the time that I've invested. 
but also to move forward, I have to spend more time. I have to buy batting and I have to get a backing and then I have to quilt it and then I have to bind it. And then, so like, I'm on this precipice of like whether or not I should invest that, excuse me, that time and money in it because I really don't like it. I don't want to give it to the person that I was originally going to give it to uh, because while she does love Frida Kahlo, I don't think she's going to like this. Or if she does, she will like it because I made it for her. But like also she deserves something really beautiful. And she's like this person that I constantly try to make something for. And it's just cursed. Every time I try to make something for her, I'm just like, oh, this is terrible this is garbage. And it's just like such this awkward thing because she's a person that deserves such beautiful things. And she's been a friend forever and ever and ever. And she does not have enough beautiful things in her life. And every time I try to make something for her, I'm just like, this is the biggest piece of trash I have ever made. Why is my making relationship with this friend so cursed? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to break the curse. I clearly need to do some sort of like magical spell. Do you have a suggestion? <laughs> and it's like, part of me is like, is it just because I care so much for this person that everything I make, like nothing, nothing that I could make would like be as good of a friend as she is but that's not it because like I make stuff for my mom whom I love and think is great and I'm not like this is garbage sorry mom do you know what I mean like the things I make for her work out and they're great is it because I just have not made enough stuff for this friend maybe I don't think that's it either <laughs> my making relationship with her is just flat out cursed it's cursed and if you know a spell to do, please let me know because I need to do some sort of magical intervention. It's, it's the worst. So anyway, so now I have this thing and it's upstairs and I like have left it on the design wall um, because by the way, design wall is literally, you can buy this like folded up piece of flannel that has like sort of like a, like a, it's sort of like those tablecloths from your youth that were like plastic on one side and sort of like flannelly on the back it's like that only it's like a grid and it's got little um grommets in it and so you can just hang it temporarily um so this is like the wall that, that my doors open out onto <laughs> don't have very many walls in this house which i know sounds ridiculous but we don't have any walls that don't have like windows in them or doorways in them um so yeah, so anyway, so it's just like, I, a part of me is like, I should just leave it up there because maybe like, as I look at it more, I'll be more accepting of it. But it feels like it's having the opposite effect where every time I walk up the stairs, I'm just like, Ugh. <laughs> I want to like spit on it as I walk by. <laughs> so I've kind of caught this place where I'm thinking like, okay, actually this other friend who I did not make it for, but this other friend might actually like it. And it's one of those things where, again, like there are plenty of things I don't like that other people really like and enjoy. It's not like I'm like, oh, I mean, I do think it's garbage. <laughs> that's not true. But like, if you made it, I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's great. It's such a good job. I love the pattern you chose. I love how you alternated these things. And oh yeah, like you did sew those, those blocks backward. But like, nobody's gonna care or notice. That's what I would say to you, but I can't say it to myself. <laughs> and like, again, you can always make things that are not to your personal taste. Like I do that frequently, like for friends or family members or whatever. But for some reason, I'm really resistant to this one. <laughs> I feel like I just put the fabric in like a food, like a blender. And then I was like, here's the quilt. That's why I feel like happened. It was not that, but that's why I feel like it happened. I'm like, this isn't even a real quilt. <laughs> but anyway, I just need to like cleanse. Maybe that's why you just like go up there and like cleanse it in some way, like some witchy way. Put it out under the full moon or something. 
to like cleanse it of its negative energies and then I could like assemble it. But I do think it might work for this friend because even though she's not particularly a Frida Kahlo person, I mean, she does like Frida Kahlo because she's a human being with like a breath in her body. But like, it's, she is more of like a fan of the skulls and the like black and the like, sort of like, this is not goth, but like, you know, like it's a adjacent, it's, you know, whereas my other friend who I originally intended it for is really more of like a, like pinks and like, I feel like, like we had a discussion at one point where she got a divorce about her fantasy of having a white bedspread. Like, right? Like she just wants this like serene, visually clean space. And like this thing is not it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think, I do think it might work for this other friend. And it's not like it's a bed quilt. It's just like a big throw quilt. Um, that's the other thing. It's sort of like a little bit bigger than it needs to be for a throw quilt, but it's like not big enough for a bed quilt. Whatever. I think it'll be fine for this other friend. I think it'll be okay. I think she will actually like it. I think she will like it, but I can't decide. So anyway, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's my quilty. <laughs> womp womp. The disappearing nine patch is really fun to make. But I think, and I like the look of the, like, clearly I liked the way they looked. Otherwise I wouldn't have chose that pattern. Um, but I think the difference is the ones I looked at were all very scrappy. And I think that the Disappearing Nine Patch works better if it is a very scrappy look. Because it's that line of like, Again, you put five colors together and you're like, ooh, that fifth one is jarring, not quite right. But you put like 15 colors together, it doesn't matter like how crazy they are, it all works because, so it's like sort of like that, I think. I'm a new quilter and these are the things you have to work out, right? So thank you also for being patient as I like sweat into my head. That's the other weird thing that's been about this sickness is like I did have the fever for two days, which by the way, I just can't do a fever as an adult. Just the worst. Like, I just like, whatever, let's not complain. But like, but I feel like in the two, like in the week and a half since we started having the sickness, I cannot regulate my body's temperature in a way that makes sense, like at all. It is also possibly that I'm refusing to wear short sleeve t-shirts because it's almost October. And maybe it is literally just a little bit too warm. Um, but now that I've gone to this, this long sleeve t-shirt, I am caressed by it and I'm unwilling to give up its comforts. But that may mean that I'm just sweating, I'm glowing a lot. So thank you for being paid. <laughs> I sweat onto you as you come visit. Like I'm just like, like no, it's cozy time. <laughs> So I can't tell if it's that or if it's like literally like this weird uh, uh, COVID symptom of just like being like, oh, well, how does this work with my body anymore? But anyway, um, so then let's talk about stitching. So I have worked a little bit more on my Hawk Run Hollow, but not enough to really show you. I don't like have a little block done or anything, but I did work more on my pin cushion so if you were with me last time, oh, I'm hoping this is, okay, Living on the Rainbow. This is their Haunted House uh, pin cushion. And so I have gotten all four sides done. So you see a little ghosty there? Oh. Sorry, it focused for a second and then it was like, no, ha ha. So I've gotten all of my back stitching and everything done for these four. Now, the only thing I haven't done is that you're supposed to put some French knots on this like boarded up window because this look like nails, uh, but I haven't done that yet. That's the front and then this is the back. So um, these are just, so I did this on 16 count 
black Ada cloth. Actually, it's not black, it's like charcoal or something. The pattern does uh, call for 18 count, but I was like, I'm okay with it being a tiny bit bigger. It's so small um, that I'm a little bit afraid that it's gonna be um, whopper jawed, like it's gonna not be balanced. Um, she does use like a button as the base of it and it's bigger than the bottom circumference. So hopefully it'll work, we'll see how it goes. If not, I can put it on a bigger base or problem solve when that happens. Um, and then what I'm working on right now is the little roof. And I gotta be honest with you, I hate this part. I've actually kind of enjoyed all the other parts. I thought maybe I wouldn't like it because it'd be like fiddly or um, tedious but I've actually really enjoyed doing all the little, the other parts. This roof though, I hate, I hate doing this. I'm like, I'm all I'm just doing is just filling in. It's not even like I have to count or anything, but I just don't like doing it. But so I had to finish that. <laughs> so just the called for DMCs, um, it's two strands. Uh, and again, 16 count eight cloth. So what I have to do next, well, is finish this roof. Uh, I have to finish this roof and then I have to put interfacing on the backs of these pieces. And I'm sort of going back and forth about the picture, just white interfacing. I'm, I wish I had some black interfacing because that is something that's made. I don't, know if I'm more, I don't know if I'm willing to go to the craft store for it. We'll see. Um, so you put interfacing on it and then you like sew it all together. Um, so that is what is left to do. And that is my little spooky stitching. And then in spinning, I have been spinning, but I don't have anything finished. Um, I did bring these to show you. So I've, um, I've gotten eight ounces and this is, <laughs> this is Eureka Dye Works, her colorway Summer's End in Rambouillet. And again, it's four ounces on each of these little bobbins. These are bobbins from Acre Works for my ladybug spinning wheel, my shocked ladybug. And that's what I spun this on. I do really just always love spinning Rambouillet. I know it's so similar to um, Merino in many ways, but I enjoy spinning it and I rarely enjoy spinning Merino. I don't know why. But this was very enjoyable to work on and I'm really excited about getting this plied up to see what it's gonna look like. It is just beautiful warm autumn reds um, and some nice taupey mushroomy kind of colors and then a little bit of this like sort of dirty, dusty, tealy. Anyway, it's very much like um, late September on a lake maybe drought season so the, the leaves aren't super vibrant or just like very beginning of the change of the leaves. Um, so it's sort of like muted. Anyway, summer's end. Very enjoyable. And then in knitting, I have some finished things. What? Is it possible? It is. I finished my now and next cuff down socks and that is a pattern by Hey Brownberry. And these I've knit in another crafty girl in her strong sport. And I just made mine little shorties because I don't know if you recall, I had uh, started these before and they were too small. I don't know. <laughs> I actually ended up knitting them, I think. I think what happened is I knit them on double zeros and I know some of you are gonna have a apoplectic fit. Uh, I typically knit fingering weight socks on double zeros. I have recently flirted with going down to triple zeros. I, I just need to, to physically tighten my gauge. I mean, I just need to like use my body to tighten my gauge up rather than my needles. But anyway, so I was flirting with like whether or not I should knit sport weight socks on double zeros. And so I cast these on um, and knit, I think, yeah, I think I got through the heel turn and then realized they were gonna to be too small. So I took, I ripped them out of course, and then I was like, no, these are short socks now. <laughs> but doesn't they look so cute? And so they're mirrored. So you have like your little fancy stitch pattern. Oh, sorry, I guess I should show you. It's only on half of your sock. 
Um, but so they're mirrored for your little cute feetsies. So yeah, this was, I have about 20 grams. So that was originally a hundred gram skein of the strong sport. And I have about 20 grams left. I apologize. I don't know what color way it is, but, um, yeah, you could ask Sarah if she'll know. I mean, send her a screenshot. Okay. I'll hold it long enough for you. <laughs> so I'm excited about those. I love wearing hand knit socks. I enjoy knitting hand knit socks when I'm actually doing it. But what happens is I usually have a pair that is like, I've set aside to be like, okay, well, if I go places, this will be like my easy travel knitting. I don't go places. And so what happens is I just never knit on socks because in my head, you knit on socks when you're out of the house and you're doing things, but then you don't leave the house and you don't do things out there. So you don't have sock knitting done. It's just something I need to change in my brain. <laughs> but I have yet been unsuccessful. So that's that. And then I also finished, this is like from the Wayback Machine, because I think I bought this, I think I cast this hat on in like November of last year. This is a muscle burra. So that of course is the wildly popular pattern from Isolde Teague. This yarn is uh, Shopple Wool Edition 3. Is it called something like Sauber Ball or something? And this is colorway 1523 and colorway 2328. Or maybe it's colorway 2442. I don't know. So I have not used the um, spin cycle. Sorry, I could not think of the name. I have not used the spin cycle, so I can't say that this is comparable. But if you're looking for something that has that sort of like marled, hand spun effect, um, this one I purchased it was $14.50 for a 50 gram skein. And I think this might be listed as DK. I can't remember when I looked at it originally. Uh, but it's, if it is, it's a, it's sport. It's definitely not, I would not consider this a DK. Um, but like, for example, my hat is six and a half stitches to the inch, um, to give you just an idea. And again, it has sort of a similar vibe to the cute little spin cycle, although I am very um, envious, covetous. That bad egg colorway is really calling my name, like that neon-y sort of color with the taupe in it. Oof. I was watching a sibling rivalry podcast and M to the third made this like little, um, sort of gingerbread colored sock saddle English leather color um, and she used that bad egg colorway as the contrast for her cuff or for color work on her cuff oh my gosh it's so cute such a good combination man my hat looks so good with this t-shirt this was definitely going in the like giveaway pile but maybe not hmm so anyway, so the fun thing is you can use two, you know, two different colorways and get um, two different looking hats. And then some people, of course, are hat cuffers. I am not really, I like a slouchy, look at my beautiful hair. Um, I like a slouchy, but I know that some folks really are a fan So you get like the quadruple layer for your ears, which is quite nice. And the other nice thing that I really like about this pattern, excuse me, there are many things I like about this pattern. Um, it works for multiple gauges. I think there's four or five gauges. You don't have to know your gauge before you start uh, because you cast on at the beginning and then you measure your gauge after you get like a bit done. Um, so you don't, you don't have to know. You just kind of have to like figure out like, okay, I think I'm going to use a size 
one and a half or something on this hat. Um, so you can just like wait to determine your gauge until after you've knit a little bit. Um, you get to use up all of your yarn. You get to have like a nice mindless knitting project because it really is just like knit until it's done. Um, I mean, you can knit it to a certain length and then, you know, or you could just knit, like if you're doing 250 grams gains, you could just knit your 50 grams and then knit another one. Um, it works for lots of different people because again, you can configure it either to be slouchy or to be uh, folded. What else? There was something else I was going to say that I liked about it though. Oh, the other thing I like about it is because it's double thickness or quadruple thickness um, in some cases is that you don't have to knit it at a tight gauge. So you can knit it at a fairly loose gauge. In fact, while I was knitting this, I was like, this hat is too loose. I hate it. Uh, it's too flaccid and it's making me angry. It's just the reason that it went on pause for a very long time. Cause I was really like, I'm just gonna rip this whole thing out. Um, but then I was like, no, I can just put it in the donation pile. It'll be fine. And after I washed it and blocked it, I really like it. So yeah, it's really just the most enjoyable pattern. The only thing different I did is I do, I do like to knit one reverse stockinette row. So one pearl row, um, just because it helps the, the, the hat to fold. Um, but again, that's just me. I don't think that's in any way necessary. I think that's a me thing. This is really good because my hair is at the mushroom phase of this haircut, um, where it's like doing this thing. So it's good to help keep it give it a little like fun flapper turn versus the mushroom. Deep aside, um, I've been having <laughs> deep aside. So there's a new game coming out called, I did write it down, Tales of the Shire. So it's a video game. So it's coming out on like PC and like Switch and PlayStation. 5. I don't know, it's coming out on lots of different things. Anyway, but you get to be a hobbit. And like, I'm gonna tell you that like the previews are like the thing that's most enjoyable about the previews is like you get to like have your own little like larder and there's like big, beautiful cartoony pumpkins in your larder. And like you get to go fishing and you get to cook and you get to have like little hobbit guests over to your house. And I did watch, I watched somebody play the like sample because that is where I'm at. And it was so charming. And she, I hate the, t the thing of when you do a video game and you have to like put clothes on your character. I don't hate it, but it's not my favorite. Like I, I tend to be just like, ah, um, so cute to dress your little hobbit. She was a little lady hobbit and she like kind of had, you know, she was like mess with her hair and stuff. And then she could just like put on, she had like the journal, is that the right word? whatever, like the like sort of corsety thing. But then she also just like had on like cute little like woolen, like knee pants. Are those knickerbockers? I just made that word up. I know I didn't, but I th is that what those are called? And like her little like Lucy linen-y shirt with her little suspenders. And I was just like, this is the most charming thing ever. And I'm gonna spend $500 to buy a PlayStation so I could play this. I am not because like I am so charmed by video games, but like I play them for 10 minutes and then I'm like, okay, I'm done with this. <laughs> and I do have a Nintendo Switch. I could play it on that. But I was like, I'm gonna spend $500. Like I play it on a giant screen and I wanna, and then I was just like, you know what? I actually think I just want to LARP being a hobbit. <laughs> like maybe I could just like live my life like maybe I could just like live action role play my life as a hobbit. And then I was like deep into this thought of like, yeah, I, I mean, the reason I'd want to play this video game is because I would want to pretend to be a hobbit and like have a very cute pantry full of gorgeous winter squashes. I was like, what? Why couldn't I just do that? <laughs> and I had this like really like this few days of just like, Maybe that's just what I'm gonna do. I'm not saying I'm over it yet. I just meant I had a few days where I was deep in it, where I was just like planning out like different outfits that I could sew. 
was trying to get my husband on board. He's not on board. He is like a big Lord of the Rings nerd, um, but he's not on board with LARPing the Lord of the Rings. I don't, I tried to tell him that he could go to his job as an elf. He was just not really having it. <sighs> but like, maybe I could, like, nothing's stopping me. Like, I could just carry my little market basket places and I could like, have my cute little like balloony trousers. I mean, I could just, just do it. <laughs> like there's, there's no reason I could just do that. I mean, yeah, ridicule of other people, but that happens anyway. I live in a fat body. I'm extra, I'm too much. Like this would just be like a little bit more, not really that much more. I'm just saying, on the commune, are we gonna LARP being hobbits? Because I think that's what's gonna happen. I, I, I mean, people dress in like cute little vintage ways and like basically LARP being like a Victorian. I don't know why. I think why it's never occurred to me that I could just pretend that I'm a hobbit. And like, maybe I would get more stuff done if I were doing it as a hobbit. Like my garden right now is a hobbit's shame. But like maybe if I just took my little basket outside and I had my like little um, hairy feet, although that is part of the reason is that the hobbits don't really seem to have mosquitoes. Whatever, I could work on that. Um, and then like I could just like be a hobbit in my yard and it wouldn't be like a chore. I wouldn't be frustrated with how poorly I was maintaining things because I would be a hobbit and I would just like naturally take care of it. And like I could just put all my little hobbit clothes on little hobbit hooks in my little hobbit room. I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway. Hobbits probably play board games. Just saying it could be a thing that we do okay it could be a thing i do <laughs> you could come visit though we, you could do it if you want i mean again there's no reason we can't even if you have like a dumb dress code where you work you could probably make it hobbity i don't think they could stop you what are they gonna be like no you can't have a flowy linen skirt you can't wear sensible you can't, you probably couldn't go barefoot. Now that's, that is legit. But you could have sturdy walking shoes and that would be very hobbity. I mean, there are OSHA requirements, but I just, I'm just, I'm just, just, just entertain the thought. Let's just entertain the thought. There's, there's Renaissance fairs. Like we could do a hobbity one, but it could be our lives. We could go to market with our baskets. I don't know why the basket is so integral in my vision. I don't even really know that I've seen the hobbits carry so many baskets, but it feels of the part and it's something I clearly want to do. <laughs> I'm out of control, people. But again, like maybe I wouldn't care to go to the grocery store if I went as a hobbit, right? I think it's a thing. I think we should do it. All right, now my camera's overheating with my joy. So like, let's move on. Okay, uh, knitting. <laughs> okay, so what I'm working on, I'm, I picked back my, my cute little trace error toppers. Um, so this is a pattern by Claire Garland. Um, wait, am I saying that right? I just, yes, it is right. Okay, uh, who is Dot Pebbles Knits and she has, she's, wildly prolific in the stuffies uh, but fair warning they are all knit flat and seamed and I mean like a lot of knit flat and a lot of seam this pattern for example is 45 pages long <laughs> um so here my guy so far I've got to still do his little triceratops frill and I have to do some finishing on his little feetses because his feetses are maybe not as flat as they need to be. And my little guy seems to have like longer legs than hers does, but I don't know. Um, but isn't he cute? 
I mean, he's pretty cute. His horns are kind of whopper jawed. I need to work on those still. I mean, I put a little bit of wire in them to try to help, but they're not anchored in any way. So like, that's probably a problem. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But isn't he cute? So this is Brooklyn Tweed um, in the fingering weight, which is shelter or loft. I don't know which one. Uh, and this is, I believe, the button jar colorway. And then this is some Regia um, that, no, this is some Rauma. Uh, and then I'm seaming it with some Jameson's uh, Shetland Spin Drift because don't try to seam. I don't, it's ridiculous to make this with uh, Brooklyn Tweeds um, woolen spun yarn. It's just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> it really should. But it was, at the time, it was the only close color I had um, in stash. This actually was given to me much later um, and it is working for seaming. But yeah, it's not the greatest yarn for stuffies because it is, um, it doesn't love to be knit at a tight gauge. Um, but it's, it's still doing okay. It's not been bad. It's just definitely not, not trying to seam with it. Oh, but isn't it cute? So cute. And so you can see the white stuffing in his toes, but those get stitched over later, um, to make his little like toenails and his little frill gets some like stitching on it too. I guess I could show you what he's supposed to look like when he's done. That's not a great picture. Um, but her patterns are all amazingly cute. Uh, but they are definitely not my favorites to knit. They're very well written. Again, the page, this, the pattern is 45 pages. Like, there's instructions, there's illish, there's pictures of everything. Um, but I'm just not the greatest at seeming things. And I get a little bit like impatient with it. Um, but his. And then I have also made good progress on my Nexus sweater, which is N-E-X-X-U-S, but this is by Natasha Hornby. And I am knitting mine with Quince & Company Turn, which is a 70% wool, 30% mulberry silk in uh, a fingering weight. So for example, 218 yards to a 50 grain skein, and this is the colorway Dusk. And then I am using Knit Picks Palette as my contrast, and then um, also some Jameson's, I know this ball's ridiculous. <laughs> it was a sweater I started a very long time ago. Um, so it was balled up from a cone. So I have made some good progress on that. I have, um, about another inch to work on the body and then I'll start the ribbing, which I am not necessarily looking forward to, uh, because <laughs> it is a very slip stitch intensive, uh, it's not ribbing. It's like a sort of moss stitchy sort of one by color. Anyway, it's lots of slip stitches, which is not my favorite, <clears throat> but I do think it's gonna be super cute when it's done. So I have not used the um, spin cycle. Sorry, I cannot think of the name. <laughs> I have not used the spin cycle, so I can't say that this is comparable. But <clears throat> if you're looking for something that has that sort of like marled, hand spun effect, um, this one I purchased it was $14.50 for a 50 gram skein. And I think this might be listed as DK. I can't remember when I looked at it originally, uh, but it's, if it is, it's a, it's sport. It's definitely not, I would not consider this a DK. Um, but like, for example, my hat is six and a half stitches to the inch um, to give you just an idea. And again, it has sort of a similar vibe to the cute little spin cycle. Although I am very, um, Envious, covetous, that bad egg colorway is really calling my name. Like that neon-y sort of color with the taupe in it. Oof. I was watching a sibling rivalry podcast and M to the third made this like little um, sort of gingerbread colored sock saddle, English leather color. Um, and she used that bad egg colorway is the contrast for her cuff. 
or for color work on her cuff. Oh my gosh, it's so cute. Such a good combination. Man, my hat looks so good with this t-shirt. This was definitely going in the like giveaway pile, but maybe not. Hmm. <laughs> so anyway, so the fun thing is you can use two, you know, two different colorways and get um, two different looking hats. And then some people, of course, are hat cuffers. I am not really, I like a slouchy. Look at my beautiful hair. Um, I like a slouchy, but I know that some folks really are a fan. So you get like the quadruple layer for your ears, which is quite nice. And the other nice thing that I really like about this pattern, excuse me. There are many things I like about this pattern. Um, it works for multiple gauges. I think there's four or five gauges. You don't have to know your gauge before you start uh, because you cast on at the beginning and then you measure your gauge after you get like a bit done. Um, so you don't, you don't have to know. You just kind of have to like figure out like, okay, I think I'm going to use a size one and a half or something on this hat. Um, so you can just like wait to determine your gauge until after you've knit a little bit. Um, you get to use up all of your yarn. You get to have like a nice mindless knitting project because it really is just like knit until it's done. Um, I mean, you can knit it to a certain length and then, you know, or you could just knit, like if you're doing 250 grams gains, you could just knit your 50 grams and then knit another one. Um, it works for lots of different people because again, you can configure it either to be slouchy or to be uh, folded something else I was going to say that I liked about it though. Oh, the other thing I like about it is because it's double thickness or quadruple thickness um, in some cases is that you don't have to knit it at a tight gauge. So you can knit it at a fairly loose gauge. In fact, while I was knitting this, I was like, this hat is too loose. I hate it. Uh, it's too flaccid and it's making me angry. It's just the reason that it went on pause for a very long time. Cause I was really like, I'm just going to rip this whole thing out. Um, but then I was like, no, I can just put it in the donation pile. It'll be fine. And after I washed it and blocked it, I really like it. So yeah, it's really just the most enjoyable pattern. The only thing different I did is I do, I do like to knit one reverse stockinette row. So one pearl bump row, um, just because it helps the, the, the hat to fold. Um, but again, that's just me. I don't, think that's in any way necessary. I think that's a me thing. This is really good because my hair is at the mushroom phase of this haircut um, where it's like doing this thing. So it's good to help keep it, give it a little like fun flapper turn versus the mushroom. Deep aside, um, I've been having <laughs> deep aside. So there's a new game coming out called, I did write it down, Tales of the Shire. So it's a video game. So it's coming out on like PC and like Switch and PlayStation. I don't know. It's coming out on lots of different things. Anyway, but you get to be a hobbit and like, I'm going to tell you that like the previews are like the thing that's most enjoyable about the previews is like you get to like have your own little like larder and there's like big beautiful cartoony pumpkins in your larder and like you get to go fishing and you get to cook and you get to have like little hobbit guests over to your house and I did watch I watched somebody play the like sample because that is where I'm at and it was so charming and she I hate the, t the thing of when you do a video game and you have to like put clothes on your character. I don't hate it, but it's not my favorite. Like I, I tend to be just like, ah, um, so cute to dress your little hobbit. She was a little lady hobbit and she like kind of had, you know, she was like mess with her hair and stuff. And then she could to like put on, she had like the journal, is that the right word? whatever, like the like sort of corsety thing. But then she also just like had on like cute little like woolen, like knee pants. Are those knickerbockers? I just made that word up. I know I didn't, but I th is that what those are called? And like her little like Lucy linen -y shirt with her little suspenders. And I was just like, 
this is the most charming thing ever. And I'm going to spend $500 to buy a PlayStation so I could play this. I am not because like I am so charmed by video games, but like I play them for 10 minutes and then I'm like, okay, I'm done with this. <laughs> and I do have a Nintendo Switch. I could play it on that. But I was like, I'm gonna spend $500 like I play it on a giant screen and I wanna, and then I was just like, you know what? I actually think I just want to LARP being a hobbit. <laughs> like, maybe I could just like live my life like maybe I could just like live action role play my life as a hobbit. And I was like deep into this thought of like, yeah, I, I mean, the reason I'd want to play this video game is because I would want to pretend to be a hobbit and like have a very cute pantry full of gorgeous winter squashes. I was like, what? Why couldn't I just do that? <laughs> and I had this like really like this few days of just like, Maybe that's just what I'm gonna do. I'm not saying I'm over it yet. I just meant I had a few days where I was deep in it, where I was just like planning out like different outfits that I could sew. <laughs> I was trying to get my husband on board. He's not on board. He is like a big Lord of the Rings nerd, um, but he's not on board with LARPing the Lord of the Rings. I don't, I tried to tell him that he could go to his job as an elf. And he was just not really having it. <laughs> but like maybe I could like nothing's stopping me like I could just carry my little market basket places and I could like have my cute little like balloony trousers I mean I could just just do it <laughs> like there's there's no reason I could just do that I mean, yeah, ridicule of other people, but that happens anyway. I live in a fat body. I'm extra. I'm too much. Like this would just be like a little bit more. Not really that much more. I'm just saying. On the commune, are we gonna LARP being hobbits? Because I think that's what's gonna happen. I, I, I mean, people dress in like cute little vintage ways and like basically LARP being like a Victorian, I don't know why I think why it's never occurred to me that I could just pretend that I'm a hobbit. And like, maybe I would get more stuff done if I were doing it as a hobbit. Like my garden right now is a hobbit's shame. But like, maybe if I just took my little basket outside and I had my like little, um, hairy feet, although that is part of the reason, is that the hobbits don't really seem to have mosquitoes. Whatever, I could work on that. Um, and then like, I could just like be a hobbit in my yard and it wouldn't be like a chore. I wouldn't be frustrated with how poorly I was maintaining things because I would be a hobbit and I would just like naturally take care of it. And like, I could just put all my little hobbit clothes on little hobbit hooks in my little hobbit room. I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Hobbits probably play board games. I'm just saying. It could be a thing that we do. Okay, it could be a thing I do. <laughs> you could come visit, though. We, you could do it if you want. I mean, again, there's no reason we can't. Even if you have, like, a dumb dress code where you work, you could probably make it hobbity. I don't think they could stop you. What are they going to be like? No, you can't have a flowy linen skirt. You can't wear a sensible hop. You can't, you probably couldn't go barefoot. Now that's, that is legit. But you could have sturdy walking shoes and that would be very hobbity. I mean, there are OSHA requirements, but I just, I'm just, I'm just, just, just entertain the thought. Let's just entertain the thought. There's, there's Renaissance fairs. Like we could do a hobbity one, but it could be our lives. <laughs> we could go to market with our baskets. I know why the basket is so integral in my vision. I don't even really know that I've seen the hobbits carry so many baskets, but it feels of the part and it's something I clearly want to do. <laughs> 
I'm out of control, people. But again, like maybe I wouldn't care to go to the grocery store if I were in Tis and Hobbit, right? I think it's a thing. I think we should do it. All right, now my camera's overheating with my joy. So like, let's move on. Okay, uh, knitting. <laughs> okay, so what I'm working on, I'm, I picked back my, my cute little Trace Error Toppers. Um, so this is a pattern by Claire Garland. Um, wait, am I saying that right? I just, yes, it is right. Okay. Uh, who is Dot Pebbles Knits and she has, she's wildly prolific in the stuffies. Uh, but fair warning, they are all knit flat and seamed. And I mean, like a lot of knit flat and a lot of seam. This pattern, for example, is 45 pages long. Um, so here my guy so far, I've got to still do his little Triceratops frill and I have to do some finishing on his little feetses because his feetses are maybe not as flat as they need to be. And my little guy seems to have like longer legs than hers does, but I don't know. Um, but is he cute? I mean, he's pretty cute. His horns are kind of whopper jawed. I need to work on those still. I mean, I put a little bit of wire in them to try to help, but they're not anchored in any way. So like, that's probably a problem. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But is it cute? So this is Brooklyn Tweed um, in the fingering weight, which is shelter or loft. I don't know which one. Uh, and this is, I believe, the button jar colorway. And then this is some Regia um, that, no, this is some Rauma. Uh, and then I'm seaming it with some Jameson's uh, Shetland Spin Drift because don't try to seam. I don't, it's ridiculous to make this with uh, Brooklyn Tweeds um, woolen spun yarn. It's just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> it really should. But it was, at the time, it was the only close color I had um, in stash. This actually was given to me much later um, and it is working for seaming. But yeah, it's not the greatest yarn for stuffies because it is, um, it doesn't love to be knit at a tight gauge. Um, but it's, it's still doing okay. It's not been bad. It's just definitely not, not trying to seam with it. But isn't it cute? So cute. And so you can see the white stuffing in his toes, but those get stitched over later, um, to make his little like toenails and his little frill gets some like stitching on it too. I guess I could show you what he's supposed to look like when he's done. That's not a great picture. Um, but her patterns are all amazingly cute. Uh, but they are definitely not my favorites to knit. They're very well written. Again, the page, this, the pattern is 45 pages. Long. There's instructions, there's illish, there's pictures of everything. Um, but I'm just not the greatest at seeming things. And I get a little bit like impatient with it. Um, but his And then I have also made good progress on my Nexus sweater, which is N-E-X-X-U-S. This is by Natasha Hornby. And I am knitting mine with Quince & Company Turn, which is a 70% wool, 30% mulberry silk in uh, a fingering weight. So for example, 218 yards to a 50 gram skein, and this is the colorway Dusk. And then I am using Knit Picks Palette as my contrast. And then um, also some Jameson's, I know this ball's ridiculous. <laughs> it was a sweater I started a very long time ago. Um, so it was balled up from a cone. So I have made some good progress on that. I have, um, about another inch to work on the body and then I'll start the ribbing, which I am not necessarily looking forward to, uh, because <laughs> it is a very slip stitch intensive, uh, it's not ribbing. It's like a sort of moss stitchy sort of one by color. Anyway, it's lots of slip stitches, which is not my favorite, <clears throat> but I do think it's gonna be super cute when it's done. So again, that is the Nexus um, by Natasha Hornby. 
and I have quite a bit left to do in terms of like I have to do the bottom ribbing and then there is a band that goes from him to him um, that's in the contrast um, and also cuffs so I have quite a bit to do I did want to say so far I've been really pleased with how um, this is the first pattern I've done from this designer and I really like how she did her wilt um, she very thoughtful and how she did it um, in terms of like how it's got like a little reverse it's got like a little pearl bump underneath of it to help it stand up and give it like a little bit more body and structure and um, anyway so it's just very nicely done again it's no fun to do well it's like I don't enjoy that process uh, but she did a very good job of like making it worth um, the effort of, of doing one and again if that being in the contrast it's super fun it gives like a like a piping feel um, <clears throat> so yeah so that's my crafting for the week and then in terms of like book talk I don't have a nonfiction book to talk about this time um, but I do want to say I found this um, series so it's two books by Jay Penner this is two books so far <clears throat> the first one is called A Fellowship of Bakers and Magic. That's the one I have finished. And then I've just started A Fellowship of Librarians and Dragons. Um, so let me see if I can give you the synopsis. So the synopsis is a human, a dwarf, and an elf walk into a bake-off in the heart of Adinishire, where elfish enchantments and dwarven delights rule, Arletta Starstone, a human confectionist, works twice as hard, perfecting her unique blend of baking and apothecary herbs. So when an orc neighbor secretly enters her creations into the prestigious elven baking battle, Arletta faces a dilemma. Being magicless, her participation in the competition could draw more scowls than smiles. And if Arleta wants to prove her talent and establish her culinary reputation, this human will need more than just her pastry craft to sweeten the odds. While competing, she'll set off on a journey of mouth-watering pastries, self-discovery, heartwarming fellowships, and romance, while questioning whether winning the baking battle is the true prize. Escape to... Okay, error. Escape for a delightful, cozy fantasy where every twist is a treat and every turn a step closer to home. Um, super enjoyable. So cozy fantasy is not something that I have read much of. I mean, there's that series where you have the... Is she an orc? And she has her coffee shop? Am I, am I making that up? Okay, it's called Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. Baldry. Um, so I've read that series or what's available of it so far. Um, did I say Legends and Lattes? And then Bookshops and Bone Dust. I've enjoyed those. So those I would say are probably cozy fantasy, right? Uh, but that's probably the first ones I've read. And these are just the second ones. So it's not um, sort of a genre that I have read much of, but I really enjoyed this. It was cozy right it was not like there needed to be more development technically of certain aspects to make it like fuller and but whatever I was just sort of I was just like in the little kayak and I was just floating along the river and I was really enjoying what was being presented to me and I didn't get off the kayak and I didn't go into the woods and I didn't see further. I just enjoyed what was presented to me as I floated down the river. Um, yeah, and I, I actually bought this one because my library did not have it. Um, and I don't regret buying the uh, audiobook version because it was quite enjoyable. Basically, I want magical creatures to bake all the time for me, and um, I will just be there to witness it and enjoy it. So I've started the second one. I don't know how I feel about it yet, because uh, I literally just started it. But I am curious, do you have, are you cozy fantasy people? What is the other thing? Romanticy? That's like the romantic fantasies. Um, but I really enjoy the cozy fantasy. Do you, is there, do you have a favorite author? Is there a series of books that you could recommend that you enjoy? It's just sort of nice. It's, it feels very good for this time of year. Like it's sort of like 
when you're younger and you're reading The Hobbit and you just want the, like, you're just like really in love with the Shire and then you're like, mm, I don't really need to go outside the Shire. <laughs> Like, could this book just be about the Shire? It's like that. It's not that, but it has like that sort of like, it, it reminds me of that. Like, I would lots of times read um, Lord of the Rings in the springtime because I don't know, there'd be something in me that needed like the adventure and the enjoyment, but I would always want to read The Hobbit in the fall. Um, I don't know, it just seems like safer maybe. Uh, less gloom and doom um, as you go into gloomy season, but... Anyway, I'd be curious to know if this is a fan, if this is a sort of like a genre that you enjoy and um, if you have any favorites that you can recommend. But So yeah, that's what I've been crafting. That's what I've been reading. Um, yeah, I hope you can find an apple that you enjoy. I hope you find a, a, I hope you find a winter squash worthy of dappled light in your hobbit larder. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye.